Well, I want to thank everyone out there in, uh, on their phones, on their computers, for checking out my YouTube channel. Uh, about four years ago, I put my first YouTube channel out into the internet, and the response was, was really strong, and so that made me want to, want to share more of my information with the public. And over the last four years, we've had about 1.3 million views. That's been a lot of fun, and it's really been encouraging for us because it shows there's a lot of, a lot of need out there for uh, the information that we're sharing. So I just wanted to thank you for taking time out of your busy life to check out our channel. What I have in my hand is the next step in our evolution as a system of trying to communicate ideas to you. There's a book that we've written. It's called Your Genius Body. And really what it is, it's a summary of all the work that we've put into our practice, put into functional medicine over the last about nine years. So if you like the ideas you see on today's video or some of the other videos on our channel, I would highly encourage you to get your hands on this book. This book is really a summary um, and a great reference for all the ideas that we use to help our patients as we share in these videos. So you can get this if you go to www.beyondmthfr.com and you'll have an option there to purchase the book either in paperback, which uh, is always a little easier on the eyes, or you can also download the digital version for your Kindles and iPads. So I hope you enjoy this coming video here and then please stay tuned for the end. We'll have a special message for you at the end of the video as well. Good afternoon everybody. This is Dr. Rostenberg with Beyond MTHFR and I have a short video for you today regarding two sort of less common compounds that you run into in, in practice and you know from a patient's point of view these are two compounds that individuals with chronic health issues food allergies, histamine problems, chronic, you know, ADD, HD, behavioral issues, anyone who's been in the natural medicine world for any length of time dealing with chronic symptoms, you're going to probably have come across these two ideas. And the first idea is the salicylate compound and the second is the oxalate. And what I'm going to show you over the next few minutes is that in my clinical opinion from what we've seen with the patients we work with that salicylate problems are in fact oxalate problems and I'll show you the data to why that is. So the first thing to understand what these two compounds have in common is salicylates themselves are really found all over the place just like oxalates when you start to look at the list of foods that they're found in you know it can kind of blow your hair back and be a little bit uh, depressing even when you start to think, okay, I have to avoid these foods, and then you look at where the, you know how many different foods have um, you know oxalates or in this case salicylates. So I'm not here to to bum you out. I'm actually here to give you some some idea that actually if you're out there suffering with the sensitivities to salicylates, it may in fact be an oxalate problem that's under the radar not being treated, and that's what we've noticed in our practice. So just like oxalates, as I'll show you. Salicylates are made by stressed plants, and we know that stressing a plant out improves you know, antioxidant levels, it improves vitamin levels, but it apparently also increases and improves the level of salicylic acid or salicylates. Okay? The, basically, that's a marker in this uh, plant research of the plant being stressed out. The plant's own like, you know, stress response involves raising this, this chemical. And I've pointed this out in previous videos that oxalates also are basically plant self-defense. In the case of oxalates, you know, it's like having shards of broken glass inside of your leaves and when an herbivore or a little insect, I should say, uh, tries to eat your plant and, you know, hurt you, it gets a mouthful of broken glass and it's going to think that doesn't taste very good and leave you alone. So that's the same concept that salicylates and oxalates are both made by the plant to help deal with a stressful environment. Here's another uh, research article just a few years old now um, looking at um, why the plant makes um, salicylates. Again, it has to do with uh, antioxidant. It's helping as, to act as an antioxidant. It, it, when the plant's stressed out, it's got inflammation just like people do. The plant makes more salicylate to help, its, help deal with this chemical uh, effect of the inflammation. And, and we just need to keep this in mind because as we eat food, right? We have to eat food to survive. Food is medicine. Some of the food we eat is going to be very high in salicylates. 
This is a website I found. I did some cross-referencing with published research and compared their lists here from this dietversdisease.org group um, to what was in the published research. And I didn't spend a ton of time on it from what, but the studies that I looked at, they have a pr this group has a pretty good list. And the reason you're looking at this on the screen and not the research papers, this is a lot more pleasing to the eye. They did a lot better job organizing it. So this is just one category of food. If you go into their website, you can see uh, foods other than fruits, but this is something to keep in mind. A lot of these berries and you know foods that we eat a lot of in our culture, strawberries, pineapples, you know, uh, blackberries, blueberries, stuff that I like to eat certainly, has a high, very high level of salicylate while other fr uh, fruits don't. So it's good to know uh, when you're dealing with this, you know, how do you avoid or lessen your exposure to salicylate? So I give that to you there for your reference. If you want to look that up more, you can get more um, diet guides from that group. And as I said, it correlates pretty well with the research. Now, why did I bring up oxalates and salicylates? Well, the reason why is in the research that we've done here in our office, um, you know, looking at these pathways genetically, methylation associated pathways, detoxification, neurotransmitter imbalance, you know, it's kind of, there's a lot of data there, but what you start to see after a certain time is things start to connect. And I would honestly say I wouldn't do this work. I'd do something else if I couldn't find connections. Otherwise it'd just be making your life more complicated for no reason. But lo and behold, we have this uh, research article from back in 2000 and it had this interesting picture. It showed aspirin, which is kind of the number one synthetic salicylate that we get exposed to. And it showed you the biochemical breakdown that it goes through in our body as it's getting processed. And what's real important as you go through step one, two, three, down to step four, you see this molecule that I've highlighted and that's called glyoxalate. And glyoxalate is a precursor to oxalate production. So it's not too far of a leap biochemically to think that if someone has a problem processing oxalates, that they will also become sensitive to salicylates. And in the patients that we've worked with in this, uh, in this capacity, right, people with oxalate issues, but also uh, salicylate sensitivity, it's been, it's been true that as we treated the oxalate problem, which is as, my, as I'm trying to share with you, I believe the underlying issue with salicylate sensitivity, that the salicylate problem improved. And eventually these young kids, you know, their behavior changed quite a bit and their food tolerance just grew exponentially once we were able to clear the pathways dealing with oxalates and, um, you know, the subsequent sensitivity to salicylates. So I just share that with you. It's not my opinion, right? It's right there on step four of this detox process, you have the production of glyoxalate. And so when we look at salicylates, it's a, I'm going to share with you a little more data just so you have a different point of view on it as well, that benzoic acid, okay, so benzoic acid in this pathway can be turned into salicylates. And benzoic acid is actually something made in your gut. It's something we test for on organic acid tests. And it's a marker for gut dysbiosis if it's elevated. It's a phenolic compound produced by bacteria. So if you have a high level of benzoic acid, you can see chemically it's not, it's one step away from becoming a salicylate molecule. So there's another connection in this story, not just oxalates, but gut problems, gut dysfunction um, can fill your body up with benzoic acid and that can in turn convert to salicylates, giving you sal salicylate sensitivity. And the title of this slide is that gut metabolites consume glycine. And I want to point, point out that when you have benzoic acid in your system, your body tries to make something called hyperic acid right here. I didn't circle it, but that's what that says. So we consume glycine. It's a really important amino acid, important neurotransmitter. We use it to convert, um, you know, certain compounds like benzoic acid, like a, like a phenol that could make you have symptoms of SIBO and epigenetic effects from a gut infection, the glycine helps you detoxify that. So as you get exposed to more benzoic acid, you, get ex you will consume more glycine and that, again, has an impact on salicylates, okay? So they're just kind of showing you a gut, sort of a parallel issue in the gut here where if you have benzoic acid, I just showed you, it can turn into salicylates, yet the higher your benzoic acid, the more glycine you consume. 
Now, why are we talking about this? Well, in this breakdown, this is from um, you know, a book, Brody's Human Pharmacology, Chapter 2, Pharmacokinetics. You see the pathway of aspirin. And this is what, you know, science has studied this. They know exactly how much percentage of the aspirin molecule goes into the urine as salicylic acid, how much is, you know, detoxifies, detoxified, excuse me, through the UGT gene, glucuronidation. And then, you know, you have oxidation and you have this amino acid conjugation called glycine. So long story short, aspirin is broken down into salicylic acid and there's really uh, one, two, three, four, five different methods for your body to get rid of it. Now the thing is, is 50% of what your body tries to do to get rid of salicylic acid, the 50% of its detox pathway for salicylic acid involves the amino acid glycine. So if I've got a gut infection, I've got an exposure to benzoic acid, I'm not making a lot of, I don't have a lot of bioavailable glycine. If I don't have a lot of bioavailable glycine, then I'm gonna have less glycine available to detoxify salicylates, a la my sensitivity goes up. If I'm having a lot of oxalate problems, I'm also not having glycine produced because when everything's working normally in our body, you detoxify oxalate by creating glycine. So again, another connection there saying if you have high oxalates, you typically have low glycine because you're not converting the oxalate to glycine. And then another thing I don't even have a slide for you on here, but just to mention is your gallbladder makes bile bile salts in two different ways. There's only two ways. The first way is it uses taurine, which uh, I will, I love talking about and it's an important topic, but taurine produces taurocholic acid. That's one of the primary bile salts. But the other bile salt, the only other kind of bile salt is called glycocholic acid, which is glycine. So um, you're seeing glycine pop up in this short discussion because oxalates, Oxalate problems could create low glycine. Gut infections, SIBO, hidden you know, bacterial overgrowth is gonna create glycine deficiency. If you become glycine deficient, you may be, become salicylate deficient because glycine is required to detoxify that compound. So there's a lot more we could probably say on this, but I just wanted to give you a short idea there that um, there's a connection between salicylates and oxalates. Most salicylate problems that I've seen are in fact related to an oxalate problem, which makes sense given that, again, one more time, in the detoxification of salicylates, you produce a glyoxalate molecule which feeds into the production of oxalates. So I look forward to uh, giving you guys a new video here in the next uh, few weeks. Hope to not be um, so absent from social media, but life has been very busy with my own family and that's uh, just where my time has gone. So, but I haven't forgotten about uh, you know the power of education, let's say. I, I still enjoy making videos, so there'll be more coming. And anyway, thanks for listening. And if you have questions or uh, would like help dealing with this kind of a problem, you know, reach out. This is something we, we look at in our clinic and we've had success with. So hope that was interesting to you folks and we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, you've, made it, you've made it through the video. Hopefully there's some, some information here that you can relate to your own life, to your friends, family. Um, I'm just basically sharing with you everything we use in our practice. I don't believe that healthcare should be something that you always have to pay a ton of money to get the information you need. I'd like to get all the information we can out there for free. And that's part of what this YouTube project is all about. So if you like this video, if you like our channel and the information we have, get yourself a copy of this book. But even more than that, if you're somebody out there who's looking for help, for yourself, for a loved one, for a friend or family member, you reach out to us. We have a clinic that serves people from over 20 different countries. And we have people, people traveling from Europe, traveling from all over the United States to see us in person. And we also do work over the internet uh, through a telemedicine practice. So uh, Red Mountain Natural Medicine is the name of our office here in Boise. And if you like what's on this video and you need some help yourself, uh, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you and we'll figure out a way to help you get the help you need. Thanks so much and have, a, have an excellent day.